See brown in your face. Have you heard of everything at once? Do you know about everything at once? It's internationally known. Aliens listen to it. It's the best. <laughs> if there's everything. something you're looking for in the 814, we're feeling a little bored and think there ain't no more. No Check more. out everything at once and allow it to be your source. It's that raw podcast that's always showing support. Highlighting the scene. No need to take I-90 to peep or 79 to see how it be. Interviewing your locals with mindsets that are global. Innovators and creators on every single upload. So much going on in the EPA. Everything at once. It's time to int- to introduce this show. The best show on the face of the planet. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in today. We want to thank our Patreon producers, Brian G, Josh W, E and D, Nick G, and Sadie M. Patreon, it's an awesome way to support the show and say thanks. You can become a Patreon supporter by clicking the link below and choosing to be an intern, assistant, or producer level supporter. If being on the production team is too much pressure for you, you can also send any contributions using our Venmo at Everything at Once Studios. We now want to thank all the local businesses who supported this episode. These businesses get the Everything at Once stamp of approval and are critical members of the Everything at Once community. We couldn't do it without them. We've all seen those cars covered in rust rotting out the floorboards and shortening their lifespans don't let your car be a victim of the harsh eerie winters this year by getting a fluid film undercoating at tommy's automotive winter is coming book your appointment today fluid film undercoating with tommy's automotive starts at 100 dollars. god that's so cheap it's it really is a great deal it's a slamming deal so you're going to want to call tommy to get your quote right now at 814-384-8088 with winter approaching are there any last minute details that you want to change or renovate around your home? Uh, I might, uh, but you know who to call. Yeah, Ghostbusters! <laughs> no, no, Tony. No, not Ghostbusters. Solid State Construction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Solid State. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> Solid State takes pride in all their home remodeling projects solid state specializes in bathroom remodeling kitchen renovation window and door installation custom design work and more including painting flooring drywall sidewalk decks decks get your free quote today by calling nick at 814-397-7854 solid people solid solid product product, solid solid state state construction. construction You know, Tony, with all these renovations from Solid State, I think we might have kicked up some bad energy around here. Yeah, oh, I, oh yeah. Luckily, we know just the people to go see. I, I know it this time. It's Ghostbusters. No, Tony. Our friends at Cauldron and Thorn. Wow. I feel really dumb right now, and I can't believe I didn't think of Cauldron and Thorn, uh, the world's largest witchcraft and mes- metaphysical shop. With everything a person needs to channel the spirit world. Practice some self-care. Find enlightenment. Curse your enemies. Protect yourself from your enemies. Bless your friends. Cleanse your space from negative energies. You can check out all the magical wares available at these for these different practices we all love and enjoy at Cauldron and Thorn. 2724 West 8th Street. Or online at cauldronandthorn.com. This week, we have an incredible guest for you. Matt Broke Boland. Incredible local legendary musician playing the best blues around here that I've heard anyway. I'd have to agree. I think it's the best as well. And we got to sit down with him today and uh, we got to learn a little bit about his history. And he gave us a little bit of a rock and roll history in general. That's right. He sure did. And uh, we got to talk about the future of music as well, which was very interesting. We enjoyed hanging out and talking, getting a little philosophical in this one. We hope you guys enjoy it too. Right away. Oh my God. Technical difficulties. Technical difficulties? No, never. Never have technical difficulties. Not once on this show. Pros. 
Can I can hear you? Okay, can you hear me? I can. Can can you guys hear him? I can hear you guys, can I, you, but can I, we I hear you? I can't hear me that well, but Uh-oh. that's okay because I hear myself way too much. As it is, so, like, <laughs> so we're right? good. We're good. You got musician ears too, which I think is a real thing. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm starting to get it from shows too. And oh my God, that's how I know I'm getting old. I went to the Roxy in theater like a month ago and they just redid everything all new sound equipment all new stage lights everything and it was like the loudest venue i've been to in so long and i was like damn they could probably they could turn it down just a little yeah. bit for me that would be nice <laughs> well you know that that old saying like if it's too loud you're too exactly old. that's what i that's well, how i know but, but that's what i'm saying like really these venues are just turning into time machines because they're making people age faster <laughs> <laughs> yeah something like that anyway i didn't think I that know what i'm saying <laughs> i didn't think uh hearing loss prevention was cool until i started following uh dead and company and watched john mayer play with his uh headphones on every single time, time he's ever played i'm like oh i guess it can be cool no, <laughs> no? I, I still feel like it's not cool but every now and then i feel like i'd probably benefit a little bit from wearing them maybe once in a while you know Sometimes I, I'll be honest, uh, I I definitely carry carry around hearing plugs. Do you or, or earplugs now? Just in confession. Case, just in the case truth came out. It is. You know, I never I never <laughs> did for years because oh that's not cool, man. You gotta no, feel it. you gotta want it. But then I went, oh yeah, you want to be a professional musician or you want to be a rock star? Right. Somebody <laughs> gave me that advice a long time ago. They were like, look, you can go one of two ways. You can either be a rock star. You could be a professional musician. Now, a rock star parties, has the reputation, goes to shows without earplugs, yes. <laughs> and, like, and uh, you know, lives the rock star life. But they don't last. No. Or you can be a professional and... Uh, Play music your whole life. Well, qu- quite frankly, all the rest of the stuff comes there. But I just call myself a professional instead of a rock star. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you got to fake it till you make it if there's one thing that I've learned. It's been an awkward experience since we started this podcasting thing, like saying like, oh, I'm a podcaster to people. At first, it was real weird. Now, it just feels natural. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and it works vice versa, too, though, because like once you get so old, you get a little worn down at the craft. So mm-hmm. then you're like making it until you have to fake it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you ever get what do you ever get annoyed when when someone asks like the genre of music? that you play and they just associate you to the most famous person because that's why i think of it oh what well, you do uh, i'm a podcaster oh like joe rogan <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah just a, like joe rogan just like yes. joe rogan we do the exact same thing you know except better well <laughs> i mean i get frustrated with that question in a different way yeah because like I, i'm very you know i've been playing this is my 19th year of playing out and i everybody associates me with the 50s rock and roll and the rockabilly rightfully so right. i've done that for a long time but I also do all this other stuff. So it's like, oh, you're like Brian Setzer. Sometimes. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. When it calls for it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not as good, but yeah. It's it's tough too because uh a lot of times when people ask me like what kind of stuff I do or whatever, it's like, just listen to my fucking show. <laughs> <find out." laughs> Douchebag. Oh man, now somebody's gotta edit that. No, we don't do that kind of... I'm not that... We're not that sophisticated around here. Oh. You think it way too highly of us. Wait, we can say ass? We can say... Well, we can say anything you can say. Want. You can even say the F word if you wanted. Oh, well, let's... Fuck. Let's not push it. It's a family show. It's a family show. It's it's all for the children anyway. <laughs> it's it's actually, always for the children. I, I have, like, some, some pretty dark songs that I sing, and <laughs> afterwards, like, they'll end and, like, you know mystically fade out Mm -hmm. and i'll just walk up to the mic and go that was for the kids (laughs) (laughs) or no no that's a children's song song. (laughs) dude the but you got to do it for the kids i mean they're the future they're the inspiration and stuff if i didn't have people that were making awesome music when i was a child i wouldn't know what awesome music is you know what i mean they might not be at your shows or whatever but like somebody's gonna put that music on for them you know and somebody's gonna inspire them to be the next generation because we can't let the robots and AI take over and do all this stuff for us. 
I mean, we don't have a choice, but we can do our best to fight it. <laughs> we can do our best to try and stop they, it. Right? They've already o opened Pandora's box. It's too late. Like, I'm not even 100% convinced I'm here right now. Yeah. Well, no, you're is, not. Is this all a simulation? <laughs> I'm not. You're See, not. I knew it. Dave knows exactly what's up. Yeah. <laughs> it's all just a simulation. It's a simulation. You get like 20 years from now, and, and we're just going out to see our favorite AI. humanoid on stage, you know? Yeah. That's, that writes his music through, through the powers of robots in a hologram. With Dude, VR headsets. I just got dope ass C three PO tickets. Like, <laughs> I just got to see believe robots. this. He beeped so good, dude. It was incredible. Well, it could be good. You know, you you write a hit song or like some some hit records, and uh, you get residuals when they have a, a robot likeness of you playing it every I, night for the rest of time. You're, you're not wrong. <laughs> All right. Which reminds me, hey Tupac, did you get anything for the hologram? <laughs> like, I hope so. I mean, he's still out there. I know he's listening to this podcast right now. Oh, yeah, probably. He'll never tell us though. He he can't. That would break his his thing, his big secret. You know. Oh, Tupac. <laughs> that would be nice if we just had robots that did it for us, kind of. I guess I would miss it yeah. though, right? We're gonna have one day where it's like, you know, on an island. Tupac, Elvis. Broke Boland. <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah. In that order, right? In that order. <laughs> exactly. All just, all just chilling, <laughs> hanging out, have, sipping margaritas, and enjoying the sun. I have a feeling Elvis and Tupac would not have gotten along very good. <laughs> you don't think so? No, no. I don't know. I watched that new Elvis uh, TV show a while ago, and I thought it was pretty funny. I feel like he'd hang out with Tupac. Oh, I think Elvis would. Yeah, Tupac would not. I, like Elvis. I don't think Tupac would be kicking it with Elvis, though. No. I think Tupac would hate Elvis. Why is that? Um, are we going down this rabbit hole? Oh, we're going down. Oh. I, I asked the well, question. No, man. no. So you know, you think about um, what Elvis did. He mm -hmm. took he took black music and really put a showmanship to it that hadn't been done before. Okay. You know, he had the voice, the look, the hips. One of the best entertainers in the world, on the planet ever. Well, he's not on the planet anymore, but. Not a songwriter, uh, you know, not an instrumentalist whatsoever. Tupac very much so is against taking from that culture. Right. No, I understand So that. I think that's where Tupac and Elvis, you know, Elvis would probably idolize Tupac, but mm -hmm. I don't think it would work the vice other way versa. Around. Do yeah. you think, well, real, real quick, a little further down this rabbit hole, because I'm interested, do you think Tupac would hang out with Eminem? That one's an interesting one. I do because uh, Tupac seems. I, I mean, who the hell knows? So I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but the so truth is, no. From from what I've seen, <laughs> it seems like Eminem has been able to prove to everyone in that genre, even the would be haters. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just gotten. He's just so good. Like there is no denying. Also, you know, and he and he's real. I and, mean, yeah. he he's shown that he's real. Right. He's put on so he's put on like D12. You know, yeah. he, he got those guys up, and you know, he's he's, you know, like a G unit. You know, uh, I can't think of uh, like Obi Trice. You know, I think that he comes from the same kind of poverty. I, I don't know enough about Elvis to say whether or not he came from poverty and came from struggle and came from the he Elvis did. did. He did, yeah. And no, he shit. grew up in a one-room shack. But his music does not quite... Well, I don't know. I guess I don't listen to enough Elvis to really have a good So Elvis never wrote he, a song. That, yeah. That's like the, the big thing with Elvis. Elvis never wrote one song. What he was was a white boy who could... Who Sing had soul. Yeah. yeah. He was a white boy who had soul. A lot like Eminem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If, if we're making these comparisons. Sure. You know, he had, he understood the craft. Mm -hmm. Now he couldn't write, you know, Eminem can write. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, for sure. But Elvis could entertain like, you know, in, in ways that nobody ever seen, you know, the way he moved, he invented that rock star allure of, oh yeah, you know, women passing out and that's it. Dancing and moving <laughs> around in a provocative way. Absolutely. And I, I, I didn't really think about it that way, but it's an, it's interesting that you bring it up that the uh, that kind of music really has like uh, Afrocentric roots, you know, the, that old blues music, that hundred percent music. Well, that's that's why I always get pissed. I I say it almost every show I play. I make a joke out of it. I yell out because um, I always, or not always, but I for the most part try and end my set with Johnny Be Good. Mm -hmm. I say mm -hmm. this most important song in history, rock and roll, because the influence it has, it's what everyone knows. 
back then. Right. And then all of a sudden you have Back to the Future, which mm -hmm. now everybody associates with 50s rock and roll and rhythm and blues and stuff. But um, I always make the joke at my shows. I, I end my sets with Johnny Be Good. And I say, you know, this song was done by the king of rock and roll. Who's the king of rock and roll? Everybody yells out Elvis. And I just immediately, immediately wrong. Go, Chuck Berry. That's right. <laughs> you know, because because it is. I mean, in all actuality, I don't even you know, I say Chuck Berry's the king of rock and roll. And I say Little Richard's the queen of rock and roll <laughs> because, he, you know, those two. Uh, they kind of had the same style, but Little Richard, I think, is is actually the very first person to to put that energy into it. Mm -hmm. Like Chuck Berry was rock and roll's first poet. Little Richard was like the embodiment of rock and roll. You know, he was he was different. He had the moves. He had the look. He could write these songs the way he sang. You know, he just had so much to offer. It's interesting and. And, and he was gay, you know, and that's like to be black and gay from Minkin, Georgia at that time period. And it's hard to say that he came right out because he didn't come right out. In fact, there's like a crazy heart wrenching interview like it kills you to watch him in the 80s. I think he's on David Letterman and he just looks so like worn down. Uh, I think it was late 70s or early 80s. And David Letterman mentions, you know, uh, something about his sexuality and little Richard goes, Oh, I was gay. I'm not gay anymore. Mm -hmm. Cause he was, I mean, it was, he was doing preacher stuff, but it was so sad cause you just see it, it was beat out of him, you know, with mm -hmm. the, the religious system and everything. Cause he was super religious Yeah, and you could see church beat the gay out of him. And then he came back, you know, I, I saw one of his last interviews, he was in a wheelchair this beautiful blue suit with these sparkly blue boots. I'm like, all right, he he's still getting it. He got back to himself, but yeah, I mean, plus back then, what, what's the question? No, <laughs> question. No, we just we're just chatting. You got me you talking mean. rock and roll history now. Yeah, I love, I love rock it. and roll yeah. history. I mean, so many of those British guys, you know, just idolize. Like I've seen old videos with like you know Keith Richards and Chuck Berry or like John John Lennon playing with Chuck Berry, and like they just idolize the fuck out of those guys. They, they did. They, in fact, they saved a lot of their careers. Uh, you know, Rolling Stone specifically, because you got to think you, you had like chess records with Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Little Walter, Etta James, Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, the like Chuck Berry's first original hits. That was one group, like all around the same time period in like the the early fifties, early to mid fifties, and when rock and roll rhythm and blues started coming around is before rockabilly but rock and roll and like primarily rhythm and blues started coming around all those old blues guys just got shunned mm -hmm. like they were on top of the world and then within a heartbeat you know things have changed oh because the that that beat the rhythm changed you know the the scene changed over the course of months and then keith richards and uh the rolling stones all those guys came to America and met Muddy Waters and, and Howlin' Wolf and Memphis, you know, all these people and told them how important they were to them. Right. You know, you made our music. We just copied you. The Rolling Stones, that's a Muddy Waters song, mm -hmm. Rolling Stone. <laughs> like, that's how they got their name. And then they put them up all through the 60s and 70s and brought them over to Europe where they had this whole resurgence and people appreciated them again, because they did. Those blues guys, not only did they not make any money, but like they helped the foundation of what we know, what we still listen to, you know, blues is hip hop, right? Mm. You know, and, and, and they got thrown out like yesterday's news mm. real fast. So yeah, that, that whole British invasion, it was crazy how influenced they were by forties and fifties blues. And then how graciously they gave it back in like the sixties and seventies. They were like, look, America might be done with you, but you got to come over here. And they were playing in front of, you know, thousands and had a whole career resurgence. You've really studied your craft, too. Hmm. I, you know, I, I, I told myself years and years ago when I first got into this, I love the history of rock and roll. And I want to do my best to be even a paragraph in that book. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, like, I, it, it's my life. Right. <laughs> it's my life. Do you think have having such a wide knowledge of like the music like different types of music or like uh the roots of the music you play makes it easier for you to put out new and different content 
Yeah, well, it, it does because it. Uh, I get bored. Right. <laughs> I get bored playing that music because I've listened to it so long. You know, it's funny. People, when I first came out with Maddie being the Dirty Pickles in 2004, everyone called us rockabilly. Mm-hmm. I didn't call us rockabilly. I liked rockabilly. I was really influenced by it, but really, it was just punk rock with like a little bit of me, me singing like this, <laughs> you know, like doing <laughs> doing the goofiest version of Elvis that I possibly could, and wearing a bow tie. You know, it, it wasn't rockabilly at all. It, it was rock and roll, and it was rhythm and blues influence, but it wasn't rockabilly. Hmm. So, but it's funny because I never, you know, not until lately, honestly, the last couple of years have I actually like written and tried to do songs more traditional to the the beginning roots of rock and roll, the stuff I listened to. Because before then, like for the last 19 years, I've been trying to write songs that those influence, but never, because all that music sounds the same. Mm-hmm. And it's supposed to. It's a traditional sound where everyone, you, it's like you all have the same exact tools. Who can get the most creative with them? Right. You know, you have three chords, 12 bars. What are you going to do with it? Who can put the best melody to it? Who can write the fastest verse to it? Who can slow it down the most and get the most soul out of it? And it's like, I didn't want to do that with my music. I didn't want to take that template. I just wanted to be inspired and go, now what other notes can I add in there that nobody thought to add? You know what I mean? And like do it kind of differently. So yeah, yeah, I I got super bored (laughs) with with that and did my best to like just change and progress it. Yeah, yeah. That and it, 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 music's always like changing and going through all of these innovations. You know, if we look back, you know, all these people were influenced by the 40s and 50s, and then it was the 60s and the 70s, and then 80s and 90s, and now we have, and then it was grunge, and now, it, like, when I was growing up in high school, it was like emo music, you know, Coheed and Cambria, My Chemical Romance, yeah. stuff like that. And today, it, it's still changing. And I think it's really, it's really interesting to me to think about, uh, how culture has changed and progressed over time too. And it makes me sad sometimes when I think about the music that people heard on the radio in past generations compared to the music that I would hear on the radio if I were to turn on any pop radio that's out today. Well, it that's what makes it so weird. So I, I have this whole like theory that honestly, it was like, pardon me, right after like 9-11. Mm-hmm. Um, so you think about like the 40s, you know, okay, let's go back a little bit. Think about, you know, the late 1800s. You have like... Classical music? Classical music. It's just starting to get into farm music. And jazz. As I call it. You got farm music, which okay. is where the hillbillies come in and the, the, the cotton farmer, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's where, you know, that's where you get both sides. You know, you have the, the hillbilly, Irish immigrant, uh, you know, to, I hate to say it, the white and the black influence, mm-hmm. you know, and they were both growing at the same time and it grew from poverty. You know, you had these dirt poor farmers that were starting to write and then you had these guys. So, so it kept going. And then eventually in the twenties, you had like the swing and the big band and stuff like that. And through the thirties and then the forties came, you had the war, mm-hmm. you know, and that's everything kind of went on pause right, but right after the forties. That's when everything kind of took this weird turn where we had, we could recognize decades through images and sound, Mm -hmm. which is something you can't do anymore. But you have the 50s. You can see the 50s. Mm -hmm. You can hear the 50s. And then within that 10 year stretch, right when 1960 hit, you can look at cars and go, that's a 60 something. Right. This recording style, I can tell just by the way it was recorded or this song structure, that's 60s or fashion. Right. Same thing with 70s, same thing with 80s. Same thing with 90s. You can look at every individual decade and just hear a song, look at a car, look at the way somebody's dressed and know exactly when it was all the way up until the millennium. And really, you know, all this crazy series of stuff happened. You know, you had 9-11, which really was a page turner up until. So you have 9-11 to COVID. Mm -hmm. There's like the two most crazy, insane things that have happened in our lifetime. You know, Uh, you know, people in their 30s and you know, a little younger. I don't know how old you guys yeah, are. But 30s. Yeah, 30s. Yeah. So, so for some reason, right after 9-11 happened, the world, it, it just kind of, within that five years after that, everything went to social media, and all of a sudden you had this melting pot of music, songs, sound, fashion. There was no, I, I, there's still hip 
things. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like that's on a a, a, a national level. basis anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can't look and say, oh, that car is 2006. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that might be 2006. It might be 2009, maybe a 2012. I can't really tell. Right. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with fashion. And, you know, if anything, we've degraded. Like people look not degraded, but we, we've mm, gone backwards. Degraded. Yeah. People are like really, you know, capitalizing on 90s fashion now. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I see these kids and wearing Flannels 90s stuff. And ripped jeans. And, and that's cool, but it's crazy to think, because I think we've always done that. The past yeah. has always been cool because it's not what we experience and it's our romanticization of the past. Right, right, you right. You know, that makes it cool. But it is it is weird now because I, I feel like, specifically in the last 10 to 15 years, the world's a melting pot uh, because of social media. Like, there is no, like, straight path anymore. Like, oh, that was blatantly the 2000 aughts. Mm -hmm. It's like, eh, it could have been. Or yeah. 2020s or, you know. It, so It all kind of comes back around and stuff too, like you were saying. And uh, it changes and morphs and progresses. And I feel uh, I'm interested to see, me and Dave have, have hypothesized about what comes next after this as far as like pop music goes and uh, what the what culture is experiencing right now because it seems like it's such a diverse breadth of of things going on you know back like you said there was like one thing in in the 40s or in the 20s or in the 60s or whatever and now and it, like as time went on it, it continued to expand and grow into multiple different areas and multiple different branches of this tree and now the tree is so big that it's hard to ident i mean not that it's hard to identify different genres but it's hard to imagine it continuing to get larger and make more changes i think it, not so much that there was just like one style of music like you know you had your your blues and your jazz and you had like your frank sinatra's and you know dean martin's of the world singing in in clubs you know crooners um i think it's now like like with the digital age we talk about this a lot the barrier of entry is so low like before you had these gatekeepers like record producers then yeah, unless, right. unless you were going to a club and listen to like a live local band that was making their own music if you were buying something that was mass produced, like that was gatekeeped by people. And uh, now uh, we could make a song down here right now and put it on YouTube. You know, right, and, we, and, uh, right, right this we, second. Uh, I did right, actually earlier. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but you know what I mean? Like before, like there was a process, like someone had, someone with an ear for music had to go, that had sounds good. It, you need yeah. to, rec here's a record deal. We're going to record something. I, and that definitely is like a huge factor to it. You know, it, that, I guess that's what I meant when I said social media. That means streaming media too, mm -hmm. like Spotify. Yeah, it, it, you know, when I first started, when I first started out, it was still kind of the old school way. You know, I remember taping flyers up and passing flyers out and like doing everything I could. And I had to go to an expensive uh, recording studio and, you know, mm -hmm. and it's crazy because I lived to see that crossover and it sucks. Because everything I learned, I'm like, oh, shit, I got to relearn everything now, all, the, all about promoting and stuff. But, uh, well, totally lost that train of thought off the rails. It's okay, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I'm, I'm thinking about going back to that, though, honestly. Me and Dave have been talking about hanging up some flyers and going out and talking to people. And I feel like with social media, it's, effect, it, it's effective to an extent. It's hard to get people to take action from social media to a degree. Whereas I feel like if I go out and I talk to somebody and I shake hands with somebody, that connection is so much stronger than me like blasting a bunch of stuff on social media about a show or about anything right. that I got going on or trying to get a record deal or meet a promoter or do anything like that. Whereas if I'm out in real life in the universe at a concert or at an open mic or at wherever, I'm so much more likely to have um, some sort of result from that interaction versus just getting a thousand likes on Facebook that don't really f matter too that, much. That kind of rolls into exactly what I was going to say about, you know, you had asked what's next. And I, I, I'm very much so of the opinion that what's next is it's not going to be cool to be on social media anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree you with know, that. Uh, I don't know if it's this generation coming up or if it's going to take another generation to like really weed that out. What's next is it's going to be cool to be camping in the woods with no phone. Mm -hmm. What's next is it's going to be cool to make real like, connections. Well, it, it, <laughs> yeah, real connections. Yeah. I was going to say like it's going to be cool to make albums 
and yeah. like tie like on tape? tie a piece of twine around them. Yeah, and like add a T-shirt and hand it to some. Like that's gonna be. I feel like we're gonna have this huge creative boom, and I think it's gonna start with a guitar pedal. I'm just throwing this out there. Hear me out. Okay. I think we are one guitar pedal away from rock okay. coming back because the last sur- resurgence of rock we had was like White Stripes, Rack and Tours. Uh, Black Keys, mm-hmm. you know, what was that, like 2007? Five to 10, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. And a- ever since then, just electronic music and hip hop is just, right. you know, taken off. Uh, and country. Sure. I mean, country will always be there. But for some reason, country will always be here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, at least probably, pop country anyway, though. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for bluegrass and folk and all that kind of stuff. Well, and that was – so uh, that was the other – we had that cool resurgence in, like, 2015 of, like, the Avett Brothers sure. and Mumford and & Sons and Trailboat by Turtles. You know, that was the next push of rock music because that was traditional rock music, but it was still rock. You mm-hmm. know, it, it kept that vibe and that spirit and that soul. Um, I think – the way Jack White went about it, although he went extreme, I'm a huge Jack White fan, but he went like, I have to be Willy Wonka. Sure. You know? And that was cool for what it was. Nobody's ever going to be able to mimic that without looking like they're copying him. Mm-hmm. But it was also, it got old fast. It's like, okay, we get a Jack. You're weird and crazy. You know? Stuff's awesome, though. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, I think the next thing has to be so grounded and it's going to take one guitar pedal. Somebody's going to invent a new guitar pedal and get a new electric guitar sound, kind of like Jack White did. But they're going to be very grounded and have their finger on the pulse of what's going on. Right. And that's when we're going to get like this whole new resurgence. See, we're, we're I can see that, but I also want to put a, a different... I think that it's going to be songwriting. Mm. I think that people are going to start getting tired of the bad stuff that comes out on mainstream radio and in mainstream media and all of that stuff and look for something that actually makes you feel something again right. you know what i mean like a song that actually resonates with you and touches your soul because right now all of this stuff is trying to reach everybody and they're trying to make a ton of money with it and by trying to reach everybody they are actually reaching nobody because you're trying to fit something for everybody and you're not going to find something that fits for everybody instead of having their their you know niche market or whatever they're trying to reach you hit the nail on the head i I gotta look this up my buddy just sent me this guy oliver anthony oh we We were were just just talking talking about dude and he's doing exactly that you know my buddy i i just heard of him this week and i listened to that that whatever the hit song he has Right. right now it yeah. was so instantly real. famous overnight, yeah. like because it got shared by Joe Rogan. Because the songwriting was so incredible. good. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I so feel, you're you're 100 percent right. But I feel like that that happens. That's already happened. Um, in a vacuum. I mean, that's kind of a similar thing that happened with Billie Eilish. You know, I, I'm a big fan of Billie Eilish, and she did kind of a similar thing. She she rose through 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 streaming her music, and she's definitely different from the vast majority of her contemporaries. Um, I just think you get caught in the right moment. I mean, that's on an individual basis. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'm, I guess I'm talking more like a, a new genre, not a new genre, but a whole genre being completely uplifted right. because of like a couple bands. A cultural shift. You know, I, I sell guitars on the side. Uh, I work at World of Music. Woo! Yeah, and, World of uh, Music. We love you. And, Support um, local. Yeah, so I work at World of Music and I sell guitars from time to time, and it's crazy how we as uh, as um, salesmen see the markets. You know, there was a time when you couldn't keep a ukulele on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, electric guitars are down right now, and I guess that's what I'm saying. There's there's going to be that genre or something where just a couple bands hit the right nerve at the same time. And now all of a sudden it's well, like, there's a new wave. Yeah. Well, and I'm talking like rock again. I'm going back to talking rock specifically. Sure. I'm not talking all music. I mean, cause yeah, that Oliver, Anthony? Oliver, Anthony, uh, Billy Eilish, like certain people catch flame. And I, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm plugged into a different, like everybody likes their own, um, style of music. Uh, I got really into, I, I mentioned it earlier, I got really into, I was a big deadhead, mm-hmm. you know, got really into Dead and & Company, and boy, they sold out all these huge venues on this yeah. last tour, and there's so many young people 
you know, and I'm in a few groups on like Facebook and Instagram. There's so many young people who are just craving that type of like, you know, uh, experimental, uh, just groovy music that, you know, the lyrics are cool, but you're definitely there for, for the instrumentals, the vibe vibe too. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of bands that have been doing that. Like, cause the jam band circuit is hot. Oh yeah. I mean, you got bands like what Jim Cotta and Aqueous. Disco Biscuit. Disco Biscuit. Yeah. All those bands. But I feel like that's something different. That's mm-hmm. an experience. You know what I mean? That that's almost like uh, like you said, going to see the dead or or like Pink Floyd, like kind of just its own animal. You right. know what I mean? Uh, so I, yeah, I, I think that it's gonna also go from like this massive mass marketing scale to very much individual scale too, because you see a lot of people who may not have like a huge following, but do have some diehard supporters and are able to you know make their their presence felt through that and i think that more people are going to be less attracted especially with social media you know it's a mass market you see all the things Mm -hmm. so you have like people like billy eilish or other pop stars that have this massive following but i think that people are going to continue to individualize themselves to a degree where they want their own billy eilish you know people are going to go back to that smaller microcosm of something amazing that really speaks to them versus uh and wanting to find that on their own level you know what i mean they don't want to be like everybody else that's listening to you know the the super popular group whoever it is they're going to want to find their guy or their lady or their band or their sound do you do you think i've, I've been thinking about what both of you guys have been saying and uh do you think it's possible to really go like, well, well what's this guy doing with, with just lyrics? Um, Cause I'm thinking well, what you're talking about with like the guitar pedal. I think about old interviews that I watch of people talking about Jimi Hendrix, like of his contemporaries, like when he got on the stage, like, wow, well, you know, like playing and they're like, Oh fuck, we're fucked. You know, and like Jimmy the, couldn't even sing and he couldn't sing, but he <laughs> played the guitar so well. Yeah. You could he, sing that way. You know, it was just like into this stratosphere, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever experience that with just someone's lyrics maybe like a maybe like uh, a bob know. dylan type some lyricists give me chills dude Nothing yeah gives me you chills. look at some <laughs> <laughs> dave's dead inside I'm sorry folks to... i need a guitar <laughs> <laughs> um well you think of people like tom waits and leonard cohen the, the i was beat, just listening to tom waits the singers. other day you know they're that's all lyrics you Mm -hmm. know and and that goes into dylan uh, johnny cash Mm -hmm. johnny cash is all lyrics you know i i guess i guess the angle i'm coming from with the question was you know what what's the next right what's the next thing what's the next thing and the truth is there might not be Mm. don't say that there's always a next thing i'm just saying the earth is gonna explode no 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 no. (laughs) what i'm saying though is uh you ever heard the expression the best never get heard sure (laughs) so I think that's what we're going to get to the level of because we have all this social media and we have all the, you know, the Spotify and all, uh, all the stuff. I think that what we were talking about earlier, as far as it's going to be cool to be off the grid, Mm -hmm. it's going to be, that's the next thing. So therefore that that's all also going to naturally follow suit with entertainment in ways. So I think whatever the next thing is, is going to be, a really nicely kept secret and then once it's past <laughs> right. its prime then people will look back and be like oh that was awesome but we're mm-hmm. not going to know it's awesome while it's happening isn't that like the whole hipster scene though like that's you know, always been the hipster scene you know, and like, like the underground I, scene you know i, I mean, mean i i guess but you t- i took pri- it, it's not wrong but i've always took pride in like listening to music that nobody's ever heard of mm. you know what i mean and if i find somebody else who's heard of these bands like dude we're fucking bros now yeah. you know what i mean but then but then when you have like every person you talk to who's heard of them you're like oh fuck yeah <laughs> Time or, see that's why i haven't pushed too hard to get too big i still want to be there yeah, <laughs> that's that's right. yeah. smart <laughs> smart business <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna wait until I'm over the hill, and then then people will make a big deal and be like, "Yeah, that Maddie, he can't move anymore." But you should have seen him when <laughs> <laughs> he used to jump off of shit. <laughs> crazy. What do you think of the concept of selling out? Selling out. I don't give a shit about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't give a shit. No, uh, you know. So if let, I, let, if let's I... talk about Green Day. Okay, Green Day might be the most famous sellout story quote unquote, that is full of shit. Okay. Because Green Day in the 90s were an under, one of the best underground punk 
Mm -hmm. invented pop punk. You know, they were the first pop punk band, if you want to really look at it that way. Um, And then they got offered contracts after contracts, and they kept turning them down. Then finally they get offered a contract, and they said, the only way we're signing this is if we can do whatever the fuck we want. No band up until that point had ever gotten a contract like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting millions of dollars, you're allowed to do whatever you want, full creative control of your music, and no band's ever gotten that before. How the fuck is that selling out? Right. So, but there are a lot of bands that come into those situations that do dramatically alter their music. Like if well, I, yeah, that's their fault. Then they I, did sell out. If I, <laughs> but so, I, if I approached you and I was like, Matt, I, I'm I'm a record producer, I'm a record contract, whatever record label, and I want you. I love your voice. You're an amazing singer, and I only want you to sing um, pop songs from now on. Two, but I'll give you two million dollars signing bonus. Two bonus. words. Get fucked. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'd say. <laughs> I mean, there's no way because like, see, that is selling out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I've worked too hard for too long. You know, it's like people have asked me, like, I, I'm famous, but I got experience. Right. I've been doing this a long ass time and I've been fortunate enough that enough people like what I do that I get to keep doing it, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but I've had people ask me like, oh, how come you don't do like The Voice or try try out for America's Got Talent and stuff like that. And like the older I get, the more I'm like, oh, maybe maybe I will try that at yeah. some point just for shits and giggles. But my my whole stand on stance on that for years was like, no, that's cheating. Mm-hmm. You know, that means I went to where the cameras were instead of like got good enough to where they came to me. You know what I'm saying? So sure. I well, don't you know. Fish with, where the fish with are age, with age, you, you you take that shit differently, sure. you know, and experience. Because the truth is, I've done everything that I've known how to do myself, and I've gotten to a point. But it's like, do do I want this to last forever? If I do, I need to start making different moves. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I'm on the the brink of insanity. I've I've done the same thing over and over, and I'm not getting different results. So right. You know, you moved in the next thing. So, yeah, I mean, selling out's a real thing, but it's also, you don't have to sell out anymore. If you sell out, you're just being lazy. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. how I look at it. There's different levels. Like, if you get offered a bunch of money to do what you're already doing, you know. That, that, that's, that's what a, Green Day did. Yeah, oh, that's right. what Green Day did. But people will say, you know, um, like your favorite band, if they want to go in a different creative direction and it has nothing to do with the money, like like people will still get upset with the band, you know? You'll never please yeah, anybody. Yeah, exactly. When, when I made the switch from Maddie being the Dirty Pickles to start doing Broke Bowling and started writing political stuff, I, I found out real fast how quickly Tides fan change. bases go down, you know? Mm-hmm. And I learned, uh, you know, I learned not to blame people for that. Like, you can't blame somebody for you're the one who decided to change. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. to try and get more fans because the truth is if I do this for this many years and I get these fans and I switch and then those fans don't like what I'm doing. But when I switch, I get these fans and then both of them come to the concert because I'm still performing all the music. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to evolve. You're an artist, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, that's like, what if, what if I just point painted the Mona Lisa every time, every time forever. It's like, Oh, nobody wants to see that. They want to see the art. Like they want to see the evolution. They might not like the evolution, but if they're true fans, they're going to want to see it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about trying to please everybody in in that pleasing nobody yeah, or pleasing everybody to a small degree instead of having a group that really digs your, your music. You know what I mean? I think, I mean, art, like painting art is a little, you know, obviously a different medium. And I want to agree with you so bad as someone you're allowed to i'm I'm allowed (laughs) i'm allowed to i know i'm allowed to uh and i want to because i love like you know the the creative process seeing different things like seeing what what different nooks and crannies can be uh dug into to find you know gold to find a diamond but i disagree i think there's so many people that will just because the mona lisa is so popular they would be like painted again Paint it again. I want to see you paint the Mona so Lisa. Play Freebird. Play Freebird. That, free that just shows free that those <laughs> those people aren't necessarily artists. Well, no, they're not artists, but they're the ones funneling the money to the artist. Do you make your fans happy? So, so that's Lisa? selling out to me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if if 
if I, you have to find that happy medium between keeping your fans happy and keeping yourself happy. Mm. And the truth is, I hate to say this, and I'm sure I'm going to get in trouble. Like, you have to be a little more important because it's your livelihood. Mm -hmm. It's your art. You need to take those chances at pissing off your fans and hope that they understand the, the directions you're making. Because, you know, if, if you're an artist and you want to go a different route, you have to. You don't have a choice. You either do it or you're miserable. Mm -hmm. You know, you think Rick Roll loves singing that song every night? No, but he keeps <laughs> his fans happy. Do you think he wrote other songs, though? I don't really know. I don't shit about him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, like, this is a perfect example. You know, hell. Look at Dead Company. They're coming to a close, too. I'm sure John Mayer is probably tired of singing Grateful Dead songs by this yeah. point. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure he's not. But <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it is it is tough because you do you do appreciate your fans. Without them, like, uh, why are you an artist? Because, like, if nobody likes your shit, then you probably need to change careers. Mm -hmm. But, at, yeah, at the same time, you can't just do the same thing all the time and, you know... I mean, and there are bands that do, and I guess I, I respect that to an extent, but maybe that was their contribution to art. They right. didn't they didn't have anything else in the tank, so they're just happy they did something that works, and they want to live their life with their family and go play shows every now and then, keep their fans happy, make a little money, and, you know, that that's awesome. But I think for the most part, they're, or not for the most part, I don't want to generalize like that, but I think there's a lot of artists out there who... You go through phases. I know I'd, I've gone through a, a shit ton of phases, you know, and I've written a whole bunch of different albums that sound like different genres. Now, I can pick apart what ones have the most fan base, and I pick those songs to play live, you yeah, know? right. But that didn't stop me from taking the chance at making these other albums or writing these other songs. You know, when I would go to write a song, I'm not like, well... I don't know if my fans are going to like this or not. No, I just write the fucking song. It's not up to me to decide what's good or bad. I just put this stuff out there and then see the reaction. Right. And I think part of being an artist is uh, pissing people off to an extent. I know. Then I'm a pretty damn good artist. I think because <laughs> the kidding. reason I say that is because like artists are an expression of emotion. You know what I mean? Whether it's uh, a song, whether it's painting, whether it's digital art, whether it's whatever it is. It's expressing an emotion, and sometimes people need to feel angry, and you are you should – it's weird to say this, but I think that you should anger people to an extent, to a degree. I mean that's part of like me being a friend like to Dave, to the other people that I'm friends with, to you, might be pissing you off sometimes. You know what I mean? But it's having that degree of honesty and trust to be able to share that with somebody that – um Having the hard, hard conversations. Having the hard conversations and not doing it out of malicious intent to hurt somebody, but uh, from a place of love and compassion and understanding. To heal your relationship. To heal your relationship, yeah. to help people improve, you know, give critical feedback, you know, help people see themselves in the mirror. Because sometimes when we're so attached to a problem, we're, we're looking at it from right here and right. we don't see the whole problem like we do when it's a little bit further away. You know, if I'm looking at the problem right here and you're looking at it, you actually see like, oh, my hand's in front of my face. Right now, <laughs> all I see is a blur, you know? Right. So it's all part of just having that honesty and that communication um, with people. No, I mean, art's literally um, a tool that we use to uh, try to make sense of life. You know, that's I really believe that's what it is. It's a it's a way of humans trying to make sense of the existence they're going through. And uh, life is far from easy the vast majority of the time. <laughs> exactly. You know? I, I, yeah, I well, I, I was going to say, like, this is like a perfect um, spot for me because um, we, we want to talk about going from Maddie B and the Dirty Pickles to Broke Bolin. Mm -hmm. Right. This the story of that is like the perfect example. Hit me. <laughs> Here we go. Here you we asked, go. boy. Strap in. <laughs> so, no. So I started Maddie B and the Dirty Pickles when I was 18 uh, in 2004. And all the way until 2012, it was kind of, you know, we really wanted to be roots-based, you know, hit, hit the 50s rock and roll, rockabilly feel and stuff like that. And we did. But it started as an artist. It started wearing on me. I, I started feeling like I was playing a character. 
because it wasn't a character to begin with. It was an overextension of myself, hyperactivity, you know, like yeah. in full force. But I got to a point where I started growing up a little bit and seeing things differently and wanting to present different myself differently and stuff. So it, it was the one of the biggest coincidences I've ever experienced in my life to let me know, you know, it was like a cool sign that I was on the right page was I told my my band members, the same guys that were Dirty Pickles, I was like, guys, I want to do something different. I want to call it Broke, I want to go by Broke Boland and I want to start singing on some topical stuff. I want to change the name because I don't want to taint what Maddie and the Pickles are, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I want that to be this fun thing, you know? And like, we could have meshed it together, but I think that would have been not okay. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you got to stick to your brand. So, so I started writing all these songs, and they weren't overly political, opinionated. They were more like think for yourself driven songs. And we spent about two months working on a whole set of those of these songs that I wrote. And the very first day of our show was October thirteenth, I believe, two thousand twelve. I think that's the date. I could be wrong on that. But it just so happened to be the very first day of Occupy Wall Street. Hmm. We had no idea. And it was, I had written songs that were like along the lines of that. So I took that and I just was like, okay, I'm on the right track. Like, this isn't going to be Other people a are one stint. This. Yeah. So I actually hopped on my van and lived out of my van for a month and went to all these occupied cities and like spent the night in New York City and Zuccotti Park during the Occupy Wall Street and stuff. And I actually got arrested New Year's Eve night going into 2013. Um, That's a crazy story. But uh, we were marching trying to get to Times Square because nobody was filming. None of the news outlets were where we were doing what we were doing. So we were like, okay, we'll march to Times Square. There was a thousand of us. The first 40 of us got surrounded and we're told to leave now or else we were all under arrest and I went to leave. I got pushed back in and sorry, I just like to get out of here too late for that. Ooh. You know, threw me in the back of the wagon. With the wagon was such a cool ride though because <laughs> they put zip tie cuffs on us and there was nine of us in our wagon. They put zip tie cuffs on us and um, one, this one girl was able to get her hand out. And they didn't search us or pat us down or anything. They just threw whatever shit we had with us into the wagon. So one girl got her hand out and the one dude goes, that pocket of my backpack. She goes in, she gets scissors, snips all of our hand uh, zip ties off. (laughs) And this other girl gets in her purse and pulls out a bottle of vodka. Now we're in the back of a paddy wagon. So there's a big divider between us. They didn't know what we were doing. So we pass around. We're like, it's going to be a long night. Pass around this bottle. Get, get a little buzz, finally get get to the police station, get to the police station, and we're all like, all right, just put your hands in the air, say you don't know what happened. So we all walk out onto the ramp and go, we don't know what happened, we don't know what happened, because our hands cups were right. snipped, you know? So uh, that's that story. But but no, like that's, that's a crazy thing that happened, and like I didn't totally agree with everything about Occupy Wall Street, but I liked the idea that it was a beacon for politically Changed. minded change yeah it, it was every park in america was now this meet and greet you know but but i did that and i was so like pumped because i went to all these uh, you know all these other occupied cities and met these people that were talking about the same things and sang some of my songs and stuff and just had this crazy experience experience over the course of a, a month and then I was all jacked up. I'm like, okay, everyone's on the same page. And I got back here and started playing some of that. And I was like, oh man, okay. Not, not the same e- Not everyone's on the same page. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, and then, you know, slowly I figured out how to balance it. And, you know, I backed off a little bit, but I, I still kept playing some of the most important ones. And then I started writing other songs. But it, but it just goes to show as an artist, I had to take that chance, you know? And I did piss people off, but like, it was so important for me to do that, you know? And I think that's where a lot of artists, they get in that funk. They're, they're so afraid of losing momentum or, or cause it takes so much to get momentum. It takes so much to have a fan base and have people actually give you the time of day to listen to your stuff, you know? And I was so grateful for that, but I also, 
I, I didn't want to die on that hill. You know, it was like, okay, try something else and take yeah. the shot. And I think that's what a lot of artists do. And that's how we get to that point where there's bands that are hated because they don't change, but then they're hated because they do change. And you, you can't win. So as an artist, I don't think that should ever be, you never want to directly piss the fans off, but you also can't let them decide what your next piece of art is. Right. That's selling out. They, uh, as, as an old <laughs> friend of mine would say, in a different context, but uh, when you die, they're not jumping in the coffin with you. Right. You know, so you have to do it for yourself yeah. at the end of the day. It's 100% right. And the truth is, you never know how influential your shit is. You never know. Because Robert Johnson, people liked him. Robert Johnson, do you guys know the story? Crossroads. Crossroads, yeah. sold his soul to the devil, got poisoned. Uh, people liked him when he was around. Well, not personally, but they, they liked his music. But it wasn't until, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, now where people are like, oh, I don't want to listen to anything but Robert Johnson for like three weeks so I can learn how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought of him like that back then. They, they knew he was good. But, you know, you just never know, especially with social media. Or I keep saying social media. I mean like media streaming platforms. Sure. YouTube, Spotify. Uh, Spotify. Uh, yeah, you look at Spotify, there's so many artists to sip through on there. Mm -hmm. And who knows what's going to happen in the next 30 years if, if Spotify is still there and those songs are still sitting there. Some of these musicians and stuff might be dead, but who knows what kid is going to stumble onto this song and share it with the world. And all of a sudden, it, it was a song that got written 30 years ago that got two views, two yeah. streams on Spotify, and the right content creator or the influencer finds it. And he's like, hey, everybody, check this out. And then boom, it's like, you know, like you, you just can't live your life thinking you know what's up. Mm. You just have to experiment and try your best. It right. reminds me of uh, of like Nick Drake. Nick when Drake. yeah, you know, like he was he he was just such a good singer songwriter, but he just he, he didn't translate back in the '60s and or '70s, whatever, um, to success. But now people listen to his shit all the time. I. It's crazy. There, there's been tons of musicians like that, mm -hmm. you know, all throughout all the years. Uh, Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke was my guy. He was big back then, and it was horrible that he died, but then he fade, faded into obscurity. I, at already being a musician, started listening to Sam Cooke in, like, 2018 and went, oh, shit, I got to change everything I do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's just, yeah, it, it's not how... I mean, I, Sam Cooke's a bad example because he was famous, <laughs> but yeah, but like what little indie artists or, you know, unknowns the the impact they can have that they, some of them don't even, will never know they had it. Right. You know, like, like they didn't die, but like kind of like the Velvet Underground, like when they were first making music, nobody was really like a lot of people weren't listening to them. And then the next generation comes around and they're like the punk artists, all who you like the Velvet Underground, oh, we, we got you know, right. go listen to their stuff. And then they just had a lot more fame after they were a band than, than when they were one. Right. Yeah. And I think that there's an interesting aspect of time too, and things permeating through the universe, um, that it takes a lot of times it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's like a slow burn. You know what I mean? It starts off very small, just like this podcast, just like your music, just like anything else in the world. It starts off with a really, really small flame, a small audience, a small following or whatever. And as time goes on, it just keeps existing. You know what I mean? And gradually permeates further into the universe, into more people, into more hands. And then sometimes it takes a super long time till after the artist is dead. And then it's permeated, you know, it's, it's titrated. It's gotten into the, the bloodstream of the, of the universe, of the masses of, of whoever. And finally it's, it's there and it just takes, you know, dedication well, to get there. It's like the, the telephone game. Remember the telephone game? You oh, yeah. something and, and, and becomes, it's like some artists may have been one thing, but by the time it, it gets to a few generations later, they're legendary. Mm -hmm. And it's, they didn't do anything different. You know, they were what they were and they released what they were, but for some reason that it just rings a different way 
you know, throughout the decades and stuff. And I think a lot of it goes to what I said earlier about romanticizing, uh, you know, what, what we haven't lived through. Like, we like the perception we have of it, even though it was probably way different. You know, I love 50s rock and roll, but if I lived in the 50s, it would just be what it is. You yeah. know, I love the allure of it and the, you know, the, what I, what, the version I've made up in my head. And I think that's what a lot of people do when it comes to, you know, the past. We talked about the kids now wearing 90s fashion. Mm -hmm. They didn't exist back then, but the perception they've put on it, you know. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting, too, that you bring up the perception and how that changes and how art in general is such a ambiguous thing and can mean so many different things to so many different people. And not only art, but fashion, you know, media, everything, it all kind of changes and resonates. I could listen to a song and I could interpret one thing and you might listen to another thing, uh, the same song and pick it up in a completely different way, you know? And I think that's one of the, that's one of the ways that I identify positive art is it has that ambiguousness. I could listen to a song that sounds like it makes me sad. Whereas you might think that it sounds like triumph, you know, it's somebody moving on or getting forward. That's one that I think easily manipulates into each other or like kind of bonds with each other and you wouldn't really think that either you know some of my favorite so sad songs sad songs are about like triumphing and recognizing who you are and self-empowerment and things like that and it it's just it's just interesting that it goes so many different directions to so many different people when it's good art wait Wayne, there's this awesome interview with waylon jennings where he's playing the song on the couch oh, i can't think of the name of the song but it's funny every verse has kind of a different thing to it and it's just him with an acoustic guitar, and it's so pretty and like simple, basic. And the the girl who's interviewing him when he's done says something like, "Oh, what that? What's that song about?" And he's like, "Well, people tell me it's about this, and people tell me." And she like yells at him. And she's like, "You can't do it. You can't figure out what it's about after you write it." And he said, "Why?" Hmm. <laughs> like, there you go. Right. What do you mean? What do you mean I can't? It came out of me and. I didn't know what it meant when I was writing it, but now that I can listen to the step back, listen to the whole thing. Oh, that's what it means. Do you have any experiences like that where you feel like the song writes itself and you're just a instrument? Hell yeah. I, I have so many songs that don't make sense and people come up and be like, Oh, I love how deep that song is. I'm like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad, glad you, it worked out. Glad yeah. You found that I didn't depth. write it. Yeah. Cause there, there's a lot of songs that I put, you know, a, a lot of, thought and effort into every word I say. And then some songs that I just spit out and I'm like, this group of words sounds cool together. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, it, it, this works. This has a cool rhyme or a cool me melody to it. And yeah, leaving stuff open to other people's interpretation. That's one of the coolest things is, you know, I've heard people say stuff about my songs that like never even crossed my mind. I'm like, Hey man, if that's what you got from it, who am I to say differently? Yeah. It's your, it's your vision or it's your, you know, your mind. I think if I was a musician, um, every interpretation that someone asked me, it was like, well, was this what you were thinking? I would go, that's exactly right. Right, right. <laughs> every single time. Of course. <laughs> well, he, I, I talked to Matt. He said what, you know, the way I thought about it was exactly right. You're like, no, you son of a bitch. He told me <laughs> that I was right. You know? <laughs> Start your own crowd well, fighting. I, I have this new song called Choking on Air, and the lyrics aren't really that deep. And it's crazy because, like, it's the way I sing it. That that's. It's not really about the words, but people have come up to me and, like, the words are like, uh, "Everything's wrong. I'm drowning again. I feel my lungs caving in. Have you been there before? It's hard to explain. There's a thousand ways we've all felt this pain. What the fuck does that mean? Wait, what pain? What pain? There's right. nothing specific mm. to that, you know. And I never address that in the song. It's not a matter of what pain. It's but I'm pain. We've all had pain, mm. so everyone can relate to that and interpret it however they want right you know but to someone it might be like oh, i was at summer camp as a kid and almost drowned you're right this that, is exactly right it brings me to but that's yeah. good art again that brings you right to that moment you know no yeah. nobody can be wrong in their interpretation of art right mm. or music which is art and i think I that remind people that because i think they forget that sometimes they'll pay three thousand dollars for a painting and won't pay 99 cents on apple for a song that's right. We're looking at you. Yeah, we're watching you out there. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, Patreon, all that stuff, dude. No, but what I was going to say is uh, I think that humans 
really like to imagine themselves as being these super complex, worldly, like intricate things with all of these um, different stimulus that made us who we are today. You know what I mean? We've all had all these different experiences and nothing can ever be the same as somebody else's individual thing. But really, when it all comes down to it, there's like four emotions. There's happiness, there's sadness, there's anger. So there's three. And basically, all the emotions can get boiled down to those three things. And everybody's... Horniness. Okay. Horniness. We'll, throw, yeah. we'll throw that into the mix. It's an emotion. say there was four. Too, so. <laughs> I just forgot. That. I was, I was, it was for the children. Sorry, I was didn't trying mean to, to kill your rant. didn't mean to kill your rant. But... Well, that is all, for the children. Exactly. <laughs> That's how we make the children. Exactly. I'm looking at you guys. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm not looking at any children. <laughs> no, I was looking for the, for all the baby makers out there. Okay. Anyway, Dave. I'm, I'm getting my face off camera. <laughs> but we've all felt these same core emotions. Our circumstances are generally different from each other, but we've all felt pain. We all know what pain is. We all know what anger is. We all know what happiness is. We all know what sadness is. We've all gotten there through different circumstances, but we're all boiling down to those four things. Human animals, and if you and if you hit one of those four things with a song, or with art, or with ever, everybody's going to attach different things to it. Just like the, the you know those lyrics that you just said. I'm sure everybody that li just listened to it was had a particular moment, memory, breakup, whatever in no, their head. I, I absolutely, and that's that's the most. So it's funny. I, I've been accused of having an ego. I don't know where this shit comes yeah, from. Yeah, me too, man. But uh, <laughs> no. Not so it, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm the most humble musician. But I, I, I'm confident in what I do. It's not arrogance. I, I just I know how hard I worked to be good at my craft. I'm not conf cocky about it, but I will say that I'm confident. But when... When I go play shows and I have fans and I'm sweating and I see everyone bouncing, I'm like, yeah, that feels good. Is it like an ego boost? Hell yeah. Mm, There's sure. no denying that. If anyone tells you differently, they're, they're just trying to give the illusion of humbleness. Like, yes, that means a lot. And it, it's important because it keeps you pushing and working hard at your craft. But man, this stuff that we're talking about right now, when people have come up to me in tears because of a song that like I didn't know what I meant when I wrote it and, and seeing like they were in that move that's when it's like okay let's cut the shit here you know what I mean like yes it's fun to play rock star and it's it's cool to have everyone yell in your name right. and, like that feels good and like making money getting to do what I love but if we're getting to like the core of, of, of human nature like that's why even if we were living in a world with without electricity no fame, no nothing, no no money from making music. I'd still be a musician because that feeling that that gives me. Mm -hmm. You know, I would still write songs because it's like there's nothing better than that. You impacted somebody in a way that like you know you couldn't do through just a conversation right. or something. You hit something, and it's like, oh yeah, that's why I'm here. None of these superficial reasons that come with having fun. You know, being a rocker. But like that's why I was chosen to be an artist, if anything, just to hit that person, you know. And I've had, I've told other artists the same thing. When I get emotional over a song, I hear from them, and I'm just like, dude, forget all this, forget the lights. Like, what you just did for me is why you were put here. You know, that's why you're doing what you're doing at the core, animalistic, instinctual vibration of why you're here you know what i mean like that's what it is and it's so important to remember that it's great and i think that fostering that human connection just between other peoples is what we need more than ever as humans as a society as a culture as a city as a town is having that level of understanding empathy connection to realize that we are not in this alone and that other people are out there and we can do good to communicate with each other and make each other feel better and build each other up and raise our you know degree of happiness degree of understanding degree of compassion and degree of like just you know being able to tolerate each other because there's so many times where it's just like you know fuck everybody fuck everything fuck the world fuck all these people this city everything 
and recognizing those small moments where you do have a connection with somebody else just really can make life so much more enjoyable and desirable and happy for not only you but for everybody that you're sharing those moments with i that was so beautiful. I wish I could have been behind the camera and did a slow zoom while you were saying that. Thank you. No, that you hit. Ooh, funny bone. Ooh. You hit. You hit the nail on the head, man. Like that was very well said. Uh, it, it's it's a very tough time, man. Uh, every a lot of people are bitter, and there's a lot of selfishness. I, uh, I don't know if it's real selfishness. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of selfishness in the world right now. Because when you feel powerless, you grab any sort of power you can. Right. And that breeds a sense of selfishness and not selflessness. You know what I mean? Like you, everyone's so angry. Mm -hmm. Everyone's so angry. Everyone is going through all the same shit. But for some reason, we can't utilize that to connect with each other. And and that's because of media and, and the distraction of social media. And, you know, it, it's a... We're in a very strange time where I, I, I've been saying for a couple of years now, COVID, it, without meaning any disrespect to the ones we lost during mm -hmm. COVID, COVID could have been one of the most important things humanity as a whole has had in a long time. It was a common goal. It was something the entire world went through together. It was this moment of, oh shit, put the brakes on everything and remember why we're here, what we love, who we love, why we exist, what the world means, what death means, what life means. Everybody get on the same page. And in the middle of it, there's gonna be people who don't agree with it. Uh, there was this fucking tyrant <laughs> just splitting our country in half mm -hmm. that uh, didn't need to happen. You know what I mean? And like, I can sit here and I can call him a tyrant. I know people aren't going to agree or disagree. The truth is it's not just him. It's, it, it's all the political leaders. You know, it, it was the election in general, just, just how evil it was to divide us in a point where first time in most of our lives, we had this common, you know, there hadn't been a plague since what, 20 or uh, 1913, Spanish the Spanish flu. flu. Yeah. yeah, 1918, 1718. Eight, yeah, yeah 1718. Like, this was, like, the first time when it was like, okay, shit's real. Let's ignore all this stupid shit going on. And for some reason, the stupidest of the stupid shit happened in it, you know? And it was just like, damn, man. That was something where all the souls on the, in, on the planet could have really connected. connected and felt. You know, we missed a very big spiritual awakeness mm -hmm. out of that because of the technological age we're in. And I think, well, yeah, I think, I think oh. that f during that time too, everybody being so isolated, and I think there's a lot of truth in the saying that my biggest problem is me all the time. And when I get away from me by doing selfless things and caring about others, those problems start to disappear. I, I, I agree with both you guys, but I really think to an extent, you know, there's validity. But I think that uh, all of us, are so plugged in with each other now with with zero escape uh and with that i mean like our cell phones and social media and the constant feeding of of information into our brains where we don't just shut off and people they're angry and they're self-absorbed but i think it's all a byproduct of being afraid because whenever you get on your phone whenever you get you know see the news whenever you're interacting with other people there's so many levels of fear whether it's political whether it's like uh covid like disease type thing you know reminders that you're gonna die reminders that fear you could out. be you're missing out you fear could of be being left better. behind yeah being left behind you see people that are posting the best moments of their life and you're like i need to keep doing it. so you're scared and when you're scared you yeah, go into flight or fight or flight mode, you know, and you don't have that ability to just like connect with people because you're just like, I need to do something to change where I'm at in this exact moment in time. And I think that's the biggest thing that we're facing right now, whether it's a virus or being left alone or, or climate change or politicians, like it's just the, the fact that it's all in your face constantly. That same thing can be said though, because the same feelings and outlook comes from um, un, undereducated 
yeah. people. Well, I can you know, whenever when you try and argue with somebody who's undereducated, they go into fists up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's like, I, I feel like that's a huge issue in general. Like the lack of education could solve everything. And I get furious because I feel like we're at a time when there is a way to educate. But we've used all these tools that we've made that would help educate the entire world, get everyone kind of at least caught up onto some plane of existence. And all those tools are used to just distract us and dumb yeah. us down. De-educate de us, if you will. I think that while formal education and knowledge is important, I think that knowledge of self is more important in that situation. And I think that so many people are dramatically missing the emotional education of or the emotional knowledge of themselves and how to self-regulate and how to work through these difficult situations without raising their fists and coming to a level of understanding just because like dave said that fight or flight kicks in so quick and you know once you're once you're in that position it's so much harder to listen or to respect another person or to have any sort of logical discourse because you feel you're feeling attacked you're feeling afraid you're right. feeling scared I have two predictions. Okay, hit us with the predictions. The first one. Say one at a time, though. I can't handle both at the same time. Okay. <laughs> the, the first one, I believe uh, that the the introduction of, of the, the internet uh, rapid speed information being funneled into people's minds is going to end up being like a class action lawsuit like Asbestos was back in the day. Like someone yeah, got a, boy. Someone got a report <laughs> across their desk in 2005 with all of the horrible things that could be you know side effects of this being introduced to the public and they said fuck it and just pushed it through anyways that's my first prediction my second prediction i've been thinking about the music thing that's though. a hell of a lawsuit <laughs> right for everybody who, who, on the face who's the picking up the tab on well, this yeah, who do we sue know. really yeah i mean we're all gonna get like a nope. dollar 27 <laughs> but it'll be the the satisfaction you know like uh for the future generations i've been thinking about the music the whole time from the very beginning and this is my bold prediction the next generation of popular music is going to be screams okay screaming in different tones of distress that's already popular but it's going to be even more popular no death metal but no no instruments no instruments no i'm instruments. hearing mongolian throat singing uh, whoa, whoa. So yeah, he's going like that, and happen. I'm like, ah! <laughs> You're like, See, that's it. That's it. We're going to get primal. We're going primal. We're going primal. I like it. It's the, ne it's the future. Yeah, that is. Well, that goes back to what I was saying. The next the next uh, form of music is never going to be heard because, God. Right. Uh, the best. The well, best no, no, no. Right. We're, we're going to get unplugged. It's going to be redo. It will be cavemen again. So, so we're all right. Cool. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I'm with it. I love being right more than almost anything in the world. But Matt, we're we're running low on time. We could keep talking probably for another hour. I did. It's been super fun, man. Dude, no part two, bro. Well, uh, you have to be a return guest, dude. We'll have to get you come on next time. It's up to you guys. It's up to you guys. Let him know that he likes us. Let us know that you like us. Like, share, subscribe, all those fun things. Y'all are the best. Check out Matt live in concert. Keep watching our shows. Broke Boland. Broke Boland. Broke Boland. I keep it real because I'm broke as fuck. <laughs> hey, so are we, dude. So are we. we know what that's all about here. We love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.